So the other night I <clears throat> mentioned this same koan about sharp uh, and round. And uh, I mentioned that Jashan, uh, the teacher who gave this description of reality, <clears throat> uh, was the great grandson of Shirto, the uh, composer of uh, the poem about the gathering. And um, I knew that, but I didn't know how I was going to say it or how it was going to come out. And it came out as the student of the student of the student, something like that. And I got kind of caught up with that student of the student of the student thing. Um, and I knew who the teachers were in that student of the student of the student. But there was something calling to me to look into it more deeply. And it felt like something related to the interwoven, not interwoven, um, that we're uh, spending time with. I've been sitting back there looking at these tonkas, and it's like, round, sharp, right? <laughs> uh, here it is. <laughs> And I think also I noticed in the Tonkas how there's a little snowy peak back there. And um, all of these Hawaiian things, all of these native Hawaiian animals and foods, and well, they were created by the mountain. Mauna Kea is snow covered, so there's, you know, they're inter interwoven even here. And I'm sitting in the middle. And that's where we sit, all of us, I think. Our, the place that we stand, the place that we, is ours. It's in, it's, right, it's in the middle. It's not even a place, really. It's more like a place where things pass through going in each direction, kind of a place. Is that a place? It's not a physical place, it's just where those energies meet. Right? <clears throat> Chertel, who wrote that uh, poem about um, the gathering, wrote another poem that he's um, wrote another, uh, called The Grass Hut which is a um, kind of metaphor for his practice. He talks about building a grass hut as a description of building a practice and living in it with the practice. And what, there's one part in that poem where he says that the person living in the grass hut is not, not caught inside, outside, or in between. And so that true place that we stand in is, you know, we're not caught there even. The true place is to not be caught anywhere. I hear Sherto noting about his practice and his experience. And how, you know, I don't hear that meaning, oh, I've got to be on guard about getting caught because that's just another way of getting caught. <laughs> what it means for me is how grateful I am when I do get caught, when I notice. Even when I don't notice, it's, you know, I don't notice, I don't notice, so I don't, I'm not anything about it. I'm suffering because of it. <laughs> and how there even clarity and delusion are woven and interwoven as my noticing that I'm my getting caught becomes the opportunity for me to notice that I'm caught which is clarity and I can't have one without the other and on and on interweaving dark and light wisdom and delusion 
So, as I was um, following this, I don't know what it was, um, calling, something was calling me to look into the student of the student of the student thing. And um, I noticed that I did it <clears throat> uh, the way I tend to read books, which is from the back to the front. Um, and it's not because I've studied Japanese and that's the way Japanese books are. I've done that as long as I... The first time I can remember doing that front back to front thing was comic books because I wanted to see what great offers there were on the back of the comic book. You know, um, you know those glasses that were going to be X-ray vision glasses and things like that. <laughs> that's why I went right to there, and then I sort of worked my way to the front. And that's kind of what I noticed happened with this. Um, it's kind of a genealogy, I guess. I'm not into genealogy, but um, when we talk about lineage, it's kind of genealogy, and um, how much that is about um, being interwoven and not interwoven at the genetic level we are, right? And the way that that manifests in my life, I notice like, oh, there's my dad, oh, there's my mom, and they're, they're, they're woven. It's part of who I am, is that interweaving of who they were. And I have a place of my own that I stand. And I am an interweaving, and I am not an interweaving. And that's not sequential. It's not like, well, now I am, and now I'm not. It's it's simultaneously moving, and changing. I notice my mind <laughs> wants to make it a thing, make it you know this, and then it's that. But no, it's not that clear. You know, um, just as the threads, you know. It's, a weaving aren't that clear. I, you know, where, where do they go? Can't follow them. They get all lost in each other. So I started with Jashan, the one who talked about this um, round and sharp thing, and I uh, thought, okay, who is he really? I didn't know much about him, not really. Turns out he uh, studied the sutras a lot, and he was pretty good at it, and was kind of making a living, going around, giving lectures, well attended and everything. And um, at one of those lectures, uh, someone asked him a question, and they said, you know, what is ultimate reality? What is the Dharmakaya? What is Buddha nature? <clears throat> whatever words you use. And uh, Jashan said, it's without form. Okay. But the listener continued, he says, well, if it's without form, then what was it that the Buddha passed down to his disciple, Kashyapa? I mean, he said he was passing down something, but it's got no form. How do you pass it down? What's he passing down? He asked Jashan. And Jashan's response to that was, <coughs> excuse me, um, it is without flaw. When he said that, one of the other people in the audience, whose name was Dao Wu, who was a, a teacher already himself, but he was traveling around, you know, um, learning like teachers learn. And um, it's interesting, there's a couple of accounts, and most of them try to make it sound like, it's a, you know, um, 
unable to restrain himself or without thinking or to sit like, you know, he laughs out loud <laughs> when he hears Jashan say that. And, the, you know, the scriptures try to make it sound like it's not impolite or something. He didn't mean to do it. It's like sneezing, but I don't know. Um, he laughed without moving his lips or tongue. Um, and uh, Jashan said, why are you laughing? <laughs> okay. And he's, Dao said, well, you might understand the sutras, but you need a teacher to guide you to know about Buddha nature. And, um, you know, Jashan's response was, uh, well, where can I find somebody like that? And I find that to be um, a very round response. He, you know, he's, he's got a reputation as an expert on the sutras, and he's just got told he doesn't know what he's talking about, really. And his response is not defensive. He says, oh, because he knows that Dao is right, you know. Maybe you've had the experience of going in to talk with somebody about a koan that you've been spending time with, and you've got something that feels true to say about it. And you say it, and the response is, no, that's not it. And you know they're right, right? But you had to say it to know that they were right. And it's not a mistake, it's just part of the process. And I feel that in, in uh, Jashan's response. You know, oh, okay. Where do I find somebody like that? And Dao Wu <clears throat> refers him to uh, one of his um, uh, Dharma brothers who studied together. They studied together <clears throat> uh, under uh, Yao Shan, who was Shir To's student. So starting to unravel things a little bit here. Um, And how interesting that is, you know, Dao Wu is a teacher in his own right. He could, he's, I'll teach you, he could have said that. He says, I'll, I'll talk to you later or something. But he says, no, he sends them to his Dharma brother, whose name was uh, De Cheng. But he had another name, he's called the Boat Monk. Because he studied, uh, well, we'll get to that. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> Joshan goes, you know, he doesn't waste time because he knows that he, there's something he wants to be clear about. And he goes and he finds the boat monk. I'm thinking when, when Joshan heard Dao Wu's laugh, that was a pretty sharp experience, right? That was not round, right? It's interesting how you can Um, feel the world that way, round, sharp. I've been doing that for a while, round and sharp, round and sharp. Um, what's round and what's sharp? When, um, when Todd rang the bell just now, and you know, when the bell first hits, it's sharp, and then it's round. And then I don't know where the sharpness and the roundness where does the sharpness end and the roundness begin? And I don't know. And at the beginning of the meditation period, that roundness of the bell going, whoa, 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 gets even rounder in the silence. So Josh and I went to see the boatman. Dao described his Dharma brother as, you know, 
when he's giving the, the directions to uh, Joshua, and he says, he doesn't have a tile to cover his head, nor a speck of earth to stand on. Mm -hmm. And um, that does, that's a recommendation? <laughs> And Jashan understood, yeah, that's, that was a recommendation. That sounds good to me. I realize that speck of, that speck of earth is an interesting uh, refer reference. Um, the, Japan, the Chinese and Japanese characters for temple are composed of two uh, parts. <clears throat> One part is a measurement, which means like an inch, or something like that, a very small something. And the other part is earth, speck of earth. And um, the, the, the boat monk didn't have a temple, and he didn't have a speck of dirt, he didn't have a speck of earth, right? A temple is just a speck of earth. every speck of earth. It's a story about the Buddha taking a walk and stopping and looking around and saying, wow, this would be a good place to have a temple. And one of the people with him grabs a blade of grass, shoves it in the ground and says, the temple has been established. That speck of earth. that true place where we stand, that temple. Every place. So, um, he gave up lecturing, he went and found the book. And um, it was a long journey on foot. And he was in a hurry, so he didn't spend a whole lot of time uh, keeping up his appearances. And he arrived looking pretty disheveled and dirty and everything. And the boat monk saw him coming and says, uh, you know, um, what monastery are you from? You know. <laughs> and, uh, he says, I'm not from any monastery. Otherwise, uh, I wouldn't look like this, he says. <laughs> A little defensive, huh? Uh, so then the boat monk says, oh, so what do you look like? Hmm. Things are getting a little sharp. <laughs> uh, Jashan responded, I am beyond sight and sound and consciousness. Is that so, says De Chang. Well, what do you think about that? And various renditions, some say, he, and there are many pictures of the boat monk uh, hitting him with his oar, knocking him into the water repeatedly. Others have him grabbing him and holding him under. I kind of like that one. <laughs> um, it's more intimate. All right. And um, <clears throat> and he holds his head underwater for a long time, and he lets him up, and he says, speak, speak now. But before he can say anything, he throws him down again. <laughs> And he pulls him up again, and he says, speak! And again, he throws him down into the water as soon as he opens his mouth. And that's when he woke up, Jashan did. And uh, you know, he came up bowing gratitude or something. Now, um, the boat monk was very happy about this because um, when he was a student under 
uh, Yao Shan, together with Dao Wu. There was another student named Yun Yang. <clears throat> and they all got approval to teach her at the same time. And um, the boat monk said, well, you guys, you got to go out and, you know, carry on our teacher's teachings uh, by establishing a temple and all. But, you know, I, 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 I don't have that in me. I'm too undisciplined, he said. Um, I like to do what I like to do too much. And I like to be in nature. So, uh, but keep in touch. <laughs> because, you know, if you meet a student who seems like they got something going for them, send them down to me, please. So I can pass on what our teacher gave us and how that's done out of love. <clears throat> Not obligation. You can't not do it. You don't have to be a teacher to do it. You do it just by living your life, practicing your practice. So when Dao Wu refers Jia Shan to the boat monk, he is fulfilling the request the boat monk made when they all left their teacher. When he was requested, hey, if you meet somebody who's good, send them down to me. And he did. He's, he sent Jashan down. And how, um, why, you know, that way that um, the connection between a teacher, you know, you meet somebody and there's a connection, or you meet somebody and there isn't, and that happens, and that's, um, that's not wrong, it's just the way it is. I, you know, it's like falling in love with somebody, and having a life together, you, that's just the way, you don't do that with everybody. So I like that part of the, because um, there's the interweaving and the not interweaving, um, Dao Wu, Yun Yan, the boat monk, all interwoven together as they practiced together and became everything together. And they went off on their own, not woven, not interwoven, but they were still interwoven. And it's not like even though they were doing things differently in different places, they were still together, but they were apart. And it's all happening at the same time. We can't understand that, but we know it. We can feel it. Listening to birds. Listening to the buzz saw. The music. And then Deshen tells him, you know, you go, I studied with my teacher for 30 years, and now I'm gonna, you've got everything that I knew, got from him. And go off and hide somewhere. In the mountains. He says, go to a place with no trace, but don't hide in a place with no trace. Okay. <laughs> And I'm feeling the interweaving of, well, that's what the sixth patriarch was told, Sure Toe's teacher, for a short time. By his teacher, go off for 10 years and hide. And this, this, what, what's that about? Right? I don't know what it's about, but I can see the thread going through and feeling the interwovenness, the DNA. And feeling that, uh, thread going through and the connections. Um, I feel closer to these um, these people who are practicing just like we are practicing. 
and the more threads that I can, that I, I'm aware of, the more what we're doing, all of us here together, we're doing what they were doing, individually and together, and supported by that. Doing it together with them, as they do it now, in the seventh century. That's very round place to feel into. So De Chang, after he says to the boat monk, after he says to Jia Shan, okay, I've given you everything, and he says, I finally caught the big golden fish. You know, he's got somebody to pass it on to. I finally caught the big golden fish. Around this time, it was said that Zen masters caught their, caught their students by fishing with a straight hook held above the water. And that's where you get the good students, the ones that jump out of the water and impale themselves on the hook. <laughs> I finally caught a big golden fish, and they, they stayed together for a night, uh, talking, meditating. <laughs> And in the morning, uh, the, the boat monk said, well, you don't have to think about me anymore. And he got in his boat, and he rode up to the middle of the lake, he turned it over, and he disappeared. He was never seen again. Left without a trace. That's interesting, isn't it? That's kind of a sharp thing. He just disappeared like that. So, uh, yeah, Jashan went off and found a hermitage in the mountains and sort of stayed low. And um, uh, was not lecturing about the sutras anymore. He was living it, you know. He was uh, teaching it. And one day, a story about him. 